Welcome, friends, to Intersections, where inner mastery meets outer impact. And it is such a joy for me to have in our midst today someone who so beautifully illuminates this path, this possibility of how the inner and the outer can unite and fuse to form the whole you, to unleash your full potential, to allow you to manifest sweetness, greatness, goodness from within in a way that really helps advance and serve humanity. And that person today is Roshi John Halifax. She is an American Zen Buddhist teacher and a hospice caregiver and author. She is the founder, abbot, and guiding teacher of the Opaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a Zen peacemaker community. She has received Dharma transmission from Bernard Glassman, as well as Thich Nhat Han, as a very socially engaged Buddhist. Roshi John has done extensive work with the dying through a project on being with dying, which she founded, traveling from church to synagogue, hospice to hospital, teaching healthcare professionals and family caregivers the psychosocial, ethical, and spiritual aspects of caring for the dying. Roshi John has actually participated in the American civil rights movements and anti-war protests going all the way back to the 1960s. She's worked as a volunteer with death row inmates and served the Kathmandu Rohingya refugees who had no status anywhere. She's also the author of several books on Buddhism and spirituality, such as Being with Dying, Standing at the Edge, and The Fruitful Darkness. A great joy and a privilege to have in our midst Roshi John Halifax. Welcome, Roshi John. It's um, such a joy and a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Itendra. Yeah. I'm very grateful to be here. Yeah. And also to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Me as well. Me as well. You know, when someone like you walks into, you know, our lives, I recognize that on the one hand, there is the conversation, the connection, the sharing, the insight that, um, you know, will unfold in the moment based on what transpires. But I also recognize that walking into this frame is a very storied life. Someone who has been not just uh, researching and espousing, but living the truths. And therefore, there's a certain, you know, ponderousness to the to the spirit that you um, embody. And I'm very grateful for us to just enjoy your presence in our midst. Thank you. <laughs> I, I know that um, one of the key contributions that you have made in your um, life has been to, in some ways, demystify and almost um, embrace the process of dying as a very mindful, very thoughtful, a very loving pursuit. And um, uh, while there is so much to unpack and learn from you, I, I thought maybe we can focus our conversation today a lot on that chapter in uh, every human life that, um, you know, for the most part, doesn't really get a lot of reflection, treatment, and conversation. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, a really important uh, landscape for us to be comfortable with or to understand or to explore. Yeah, wonderful. You, you've said death is not usually regarded in contemporary Western culture as a teacher with whom to spend time, but rather as a looming biological and even moral failure to be denied and avoided. I've often felt that, you know, just about our healthcare system, the whole process of how families relate, you know, to those moments where a loved one is passing away and, and then what happens even after that moment in the manner in which, um, you know, we uh, cremate and hold a memorial service. There's a, there's a very hands-off kind of, almost like a morbid view, you know, of death. Can you talk a little bit about sort of um, how there are traditions and teachings that um, take a whole different approach towards our attitude towards death? Mm. I think one of the most uh, powerful perspectives on being with dying uh, it comes out of the Buddhist tradition where uh, at the moment of death, um, that moment or that experience or that process um, is considered to be the ultimate moment of liberation. 
Um, and that uh, when we say the word liberation, we mean um, not just the body dropping off, but uh, the substrate consciousness or the, the experience of mind um, being completely free. And so that, you know, from this perspective, um, uh, and, and it's very interesting to look at um, my own experience with dying people uh, from this view, a person who has this view, the view that the moment of death is the most precious and powerful moment of liberation, then um, your whole life, uh, everything about it, um, uh, how you treat others, how you serve the world, um, how you cultivate and train the mind, heart, and body is in a way in anticipation of this moment, of this extraordinary possibility. And I reflect in my book, I think it was in, in Being With Dying, an uh, encounter I had with an old Tibetan Lama who said to me he was really looking forward to death. Um, because of this view, the view that uh, the moment of death provides this opportunity for being free. And I was very moved um, by his view because what it meant to me was um, not putting aside the present moment, but to actually be in the present moment in such a way as the liberation was already there. And I was very struck by um, his joy, but also that deep wisdom that he carried, not uh, about getting something at the end of his life, but how he actually related to the present moment. Uh, how beautiful. How beautiful. You know, sometimes I think about how every moment in some ways is a moment where we are dying in some ways, you know, to the past and having to, you know, peacefully accept a certain shift, a certain change, a certain something that won't, you know, in a physical material way be with us anymore. You know, I look at pictures of my daughter from the time that she was a little baby and a little child and those, mm -hmm. you know, those cute little cheeks and rosy cheeks and that, you know, and all of that. Um, memories, those fond memories that parents sometimes have of those early years. You know, you have to kind of like at some level die to them. You can keep them almost as fond memories. But uh, obviously, from a physical standpoint, that's an experience that has been lived and a chapter that has been closed out. And um, when I think of death in that context, Roshi John, one of the thoughts that is coming to my mind is that there is a distinction between, I guess, someone who sees death as an abrupt and absolute end versus someone who sees death as a portal to something beyond. And of course, that uh, starts to then raise the question about um, whether consciousness and spirit, whatever you want to call it, soul, lasts beyond the physical. And so this question about you know, whether or not one believes in um, an idea of reincarnation, just simply at least the idea of the um, continuity of uh, consciousness that goes beyond the body. I'm just... Uh, intrigued in, in the Buddhist traditions as in a limited way I know them. Uh, this, is, this is core to um, Buddhist philosophy and teachings. Here in the West, in the manner in which um, you know, Buddhism has been a shining light in recent decades, um, is, that, is that still very much the foundation on which this thinking of um, seeing death as almost like a, like a friend, you know, is, is, is that foundation still very much along these lines of recognizing that death is not an absolute end and that we are more than just physical beings? I think it really depends on the school of Buddhism. It's interesting. For example, um, in the Theravada school or in the Vajrayana school, in the Tibetan school, there is a deep emphasis on the presence of um, uh, or the possibility, or actually more than the possibility, um, that uh, we uh, will find ourselves in certain circumstances in a future life. Uh, the notion of reincarnation comes very much out of the Hindu context, and of course was incorporated into the Buddhist context. Now, I'm a Zen person, so, so though I've also done 
practice within the Theravadan context and also the Vajrayana context, um, I tend to have a more investigative or pragmatic view, which is perhaps that is the case. You know, when people ask me, for example, who are dying, where will I go after death? Or will I be reincarnated after death? I have to honestly say, I don't know. And, you know, I say it with a lot of humility because the truth is, I don't know. And I have to live that truth and be, you know, in my integrity when I'm interacting with others. So, but I live with that possibility. It could be that this is the case. And then, you know, one from uh, the perspective of being pragmatic and uh, direct would choose, for example, um, to live a life as if that were a possibility or that were, uh, in fact, truth. And so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, in a more folkloric perspective, it's a kind of in, uh, wonderful incentive program to think that, you know, if you do a lot of good deeds and you're a wonderful person in this life, you'll have an auspicious rebirth in the next. So that's, you know, that's very incentivizing. Um, I, I, and I like that kind of uh, ethical uh, uh, incentive, if you will. It, it's, it's, it has, it's kind of inspiring. But at the level of, um, you know, science and actuality, I think we have to be open. Um, and at the same time that we're open, um, live, a, live an ethical life, if you will, a life of great heart and kindness. Uh, and, you know, the other side of the equation, there have been some uh, interesting studies like uh, Ian Stevenson on 20 cases of reincarnation. This was done decades ago where um, he was basically doing research on people who remembered past lives that had, uh, you know, very specific detail. So, you know, who know? I don't know. Um, and I live that I don't know, honestly. And, but I also live with that possibility awake inside of me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being so thoughtful and um, high in your own personal integrity and in how you think about this and respond in that moment to uh, individuals hungering for some clarity about what lies ahead. Well, I um, want to say, you know, when someone asks me that question, who's dying, I mean, what I do is I turn the question to them. Because actually, you know, their view, their experience, um, I'm there to support and validate, not to lay on them some kind of story for or against uh, uh, an, an Eastern view. So it's, you know, I, I'm not there to um, offer false reassurance, but I'm there to actually... Um, come alongside a dying person in such a way that um, uh, is um, respectful and uh, acknowledging of their insights, uh, their perspective, their views. So, you know, I'll say, you know, I, I'm not quite sure, but what do you think? Share with me what, what your sense of this is. Wow. That's, uh, that's very special. Do you find that when you ask that question, that you catalyze in them a depth of um, reflection of a kind that they may have not paused and really even perhaps engaged in in recent times or something? Do you take them to a place of self-discovery um, that may have been otherwise missed from their everyday sort of awareness? I can't say for sure, but and I don't take them anywhere. They take themselves, if you will. And I think that, um, you know, part of working with dying people for so many decades, and I began this work really in 1970. So, you know, it was one of these very formative experiences in, in my uh, life that uh, uh, brought me um, out of, if you will, the, the world of expertness and expertise into a kind of curiosity, maybe a little bit of humbleness or humility. Uh, you know, you see so much in working with dying people. You're kind of brought to your knees uh, in every encounter. 
And as such, uh, I don't really, I, I don't feel comfortable ever at this point in my life. Right. You know, I'm entering my 80th year uh, uh, in a few months. And I'm at that time of my life where um, I really sit with not knowing. You know, I sit with this kind of openness. Uh, I feel like I'm learning uh, more as I age and as I let go of my expertise. Mm -hmm. How beautiful. How beautiful. A state of not knowing. You talk about that as um, one of three core principles that um, you have found to be really really valuable in, in your 40 odd years of this journey, not knowing. And then you have two more uh, you talk about uh, bearing witness and compassionate action. Could you, could you talk about those as well? Mm -hmm. This is um, a, a teaching that I received from my last Zen teacher, Roshi Bernie Glassman and his wife, uh, Roshi Jishu Angyu Holmes. And, um, you know, I had spent many years working with dying people I was also, uh, I worked in the prison system on death row and maximum security. And, uh, you know, these are, in, in a way, um, the world of lost causes. <laughs> you know, when you work with dying people, there's a 100% attrition rate. And death row, people might not be put to death, but um, their lives, in a way, have ended. But in another way, haven't. And so uh, when I began to work um, with Bernie and Jishu, uh, they offered these, what they called the three tenets. And the first one is not knowing. And by not knowing, it is, you know, really being in this kind of beginner's mind or the kind of this openness toward things as they are. Um, it's not about being stupid um, or being ignorant in the sort of gross sense of the word but it's really having curiosity uh, engaged, um, willing to be surprised, uh, this kind of uh, okayness with being in a, a groundless situation moment by moment, um, the energy to investigate, to inquire deeply. And, you know, that um, sensibility, I think, is, you know, it proved to be very important for me working um, with dying people and also in the prison system. And I saw it uh, realized so uh, uh, wildly when I went with uh, Bernie um, to Auschwitz in a bearing witness retreat where, you know, 120, 130 people from various parts of the world, including, you know, offspring of Nazis, uh, camp survivors, and uh, people, uh, gypsies, you know, we were all gathered together for five days in Auschwitz, um, really living the three tenets. And it's a tough assignment, you know, and I think about Ukraine uh, right now, you know, uh, I, of course, I, I'm an anti-war person, <laughs> as you can imagine. And how do I bring not knowing into my own sentiments as someone who uh, feels deeply about the great harm caused by the violence in war? So, you know, sitting with that kind of openness, without opinions uh, obfuscating uh, one's view, um, even, uh, even one's experience. So that first tenet is a really tough one, for particularly for Western individuals whose identities are so tied up in being knowing entities. You know, the more stuff we know, the bigger our ego gets and the more power we have in the world, supposedly. And so it's one of those situations that's so uh, against the stream of the Western psyche where knowledge um, becomes uh, who we are. So not knowing, radical. And then uh, from the space of not knowing, the second tenet is of bearing witness. And what does that mean to, um, you know, both come alongside but not separate from whatever is arising in the present moment. 
And so this includes not only phenomena external to us, like we're interacting with a man on death row who has killed his parents, or he has raped and murdered a little girl. So, you know, how do you come alongside uh, that kind of person? Well, one of the ways is you recognize by the experience, through the experience of bearing witness, for example, that the states of mind that um, conduce to violence, to harm, to war, to rape, to uh, environmental destruction, those states of mind you discover by bearing witness uh, are also, you know, inside of you in a certain way, but they are states characterized by profound suffering. And it changes how you perceive the world. You know, instead of what we're seeing in uh, Ukraine, where there's such, you know, the positions are now hardened, it's going to be very difficult um, to dial down this war through peaceful negotiations. Now we see, you know, people have opinions. They are exercising those opinions through the medium of, of violence, you know, offensive and defensive, et cetera. So, you know, bearing witness is a really powerful process where you do not separate from things as they are. And you can only really do that, Hitendra, through the experience of not knowing this kind of radical openness and to understand that your own subjectivity, your own sense of who you are is not bound in the ego or your roles in the world, but it's an intersubjective experience where you see that you're not separate from any being or thing, including the most hardened criminal or politician or a, a child who's suffering uh, in a basement uh, in uh, Donbass. So, you know, it's at that level of uh, bearing witness, not only to the suffering in the world, you know, bearing witness also, it's, um, it involves bearing witness to whatever's arising, including joy. It's not just the, the most heavy uh, um, things in life. It's, you know, bearing witness to the whole thing. And then from that arises compassionate action. And so these three tenets, when they were shared with me many years ago, I was, uh, there, these uh, were, you know, I'd already been a longtime Buddhist practitioner and then, uh, uh, and had uh, practiced um, uh, with, with Thich Nhat Hanh for years. And then I wanted to practice with somebody who was a little bit more in the trenches, so to speak, and Glassman Roshi was definitely that, you know, an old, tough Jewish guy. <laughs> And uh, but also tender and brilliant. I learned so much in um, the several decades of practicing with him. And, you know, I, I saw immediately how this would change my relationship to the world of suffering that I was uh, and had been serving and still endeavoring to serve. So much to soak in from just those very three Simple tenets, simple but profound. As I understand that bearing witness, um, one that you shared and applied to more of life than just merely that one specific moment of supporting somebody in the process of dying, but really as an act that you engage in, in in every moment, the mindful act of just bearing witness. If I understand it correct, is that sort of a state that you encourage people to withhold judgment is that about like non-judgmental <laughs> observation is that kind of yeah of course uh um, you got it right away exactly uh, that you know it's it's withholding judgment um but also seeing one's own judgments arise you know it's not like i'm withholding judgment you know f uh, our biases our judgments our opinions are constantly percolating through the landscape of our mental continuum. And so, you know, it's not to separate from the truth of our own struggles and stupidities. It's also to approach them from not knowing and bearing witness, to, you know, be aware of what's happening that actually distorts our perception of reality. Mm -hmm. So then when you speak about our interconnectivity and interdependence, you know, if I understand it correctly, as we are observing, you know, the things that are happening around us, it is stirring something within us. 
And that is in some ways the interconnectivity that is arising there, which is um, in that bearing of witness, you are encouraging us not just to bear witness to the outer phenomena of what is happening, but also to the inner phenomena of what is exactly. arising. You know, in um, uh, our tradition, we have what are called the four bodhisattva vows. And the first vow, um, the way that we actually translated uh, this vow was, is thus, creations are numberless, I vow to free them. So when we say um, creations are numberless, it's not only all those beings and things and the, you know, uh, those who are in prison and dying and those who are in refugee camps and fleeing the climate catastrophe, but it's also the creations of our own mind, if you get what I'm saying. So you know, we're really trying to free ourselves from the distorted views that make it impossible for us to actually perceive reality in an undiluted uh, way. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. One of the questions I'm intrigued to ask is, um, since you have had the opportunity to be um, in service of people who are in that you know final sort of moments of their life and such a diverse range of people they say in some ways like death is the great equalizer and um, when we think about how we tend to live in you know in the world there is such a level of you know rank ordering you know of people based on profession and you know wealth and you know, their charisma and other such qualities, their, their physical um, makeup and other such qualities. And I'm just curious, as you have held the hands of, um, you know, such a wide range of individuals as they've come to their point of passing, who are the people or what are the kind of uh, lives that people have led that have allowed them to approach that moment with more grace uh, than, than others who may have struggled more with it? Yeah. Uh, you know, what can we reverse engineer and learn from the, um, you know, the, the graceful way in which some people have approached that moment as to how we should be living a life? I, I'm just thinking about a death that actually I did not observe, but a close friend of mine um, did. Uh, and it, it was a, a death that of an older woman uh, and her children were by her bedside in uh, the final moments uh, of her life. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the death I, I would sort of want myself. In her last moments, um, uh, she uttered the words, beautiful, beautiful. And when her daughter told me that, uh, I realized it was a kind of transmissional experience that um, her daughter felt liberated, if you will, or somehow blessed or um, uh, was given the deepest benediction by her mother. And that benediction had changed her daughter's view of what it meant to die. Um, now, I asked her about her mother, and her mother was not that educated at all. Was there was nothing exceptional from her daughter's point of view about her mother, except that she had been, uh, in the course of her life, a genuinely kind person. So I think that's a, a kind of, that really, really moved me. You know, it was the kind of experience that um, I realized, we can say death is the great equalizer, but uh, I've seen, it, not everything, but I've seen a lot, uh, deaths that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, or uh, a friend, uh, actually not a friend, I haven't, uh, don't know him uh, personally except now through Zoom, you know, a very uh, renowned uh, researcher who is uh, uh, dying, and uh, his sister is an acquaintance of mine, and in interacting with him um, just a few days ago, um, uh, I felt that same sensibility, you know, the sort of sense of uh, bringing blessing of his life into this moment to, uh, because he realizes at the pre-conscious level, and we didn't talk about this, but this is what I sense, 
that how he meets dying is going to actually affect um, his sister, his wife, his children, and so forth. You know, he wants to bring his best um, to this final journey. And he's doing that in a very intentional way. Now, we cannot say what will happen, you know, because he's still alive at the moment of his death. But um, the, the fact that, uh, or in my uh, interaction with him, I was so incredibly moved by his uh, commitment to integrity. And he even talked about, you know, when he went through a very uh, difficult uh, uh, series of uh, chemos um, in the hospital, that he had made a commitment to encounter each person um, with kindness, you know, in that context. And I, I, you know, I have to say, making that sort of vow to yourself really has an impact on this journey that we call living and dying. The other thing I want to say, Hitendra, is um, that uh, so many people, um, you know, they'll get their catastrophic diagnosis and then want to, you know, kind of hurry up and get spiritual fast. But it's really our whole life. It's a little tough to undo the knots in a, uh, you know, while you're also your own medical manager and dealing with, you know, the whole sort of psychophysical aspects of dying. And then you throw mindfulness practice in the middle. Good luck. It's, I, I really encourage people to, you know, begin um, practice now. It affects living and dying. <laughs> don't wait. Please yeah, don't wait. yeah. You reminded me of a story one of my students shared. Um, she said that, um, you know, I had a very loving relationship with my parents, and I want to share a little bit about my moments with my father. He would always be checking in and calling me and asking you know, daughter, have you eaten breakfast? Have you eaten lunch? And sometimes I would tell him that, dad, it's only 11 a.m. I don't need to eat lunch right now. Don't worry, I'm good. And, all of that. and then she said about how he aged. And at some point he um, was really struggling with his health. He was in quite, you know, quite mm -hmm. great pain and, you know, was on the respirator for a while and everything. And then she was there, you know, kind of just uh, coming over to visit him and, and, and holding his hand. And, and the first thing that came to his lips as he saw his daughter, he just lit up and just like wanted to check in, you know, have you eaten today? You know, I just want to make sure you're nourished. <laughs> yeah, um, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That capacity to transcend, you know, your own material condition to yeah. look out and serve and connect with the world, right? That's um, until I, you know, heard that story, you know, I had this kind of view that there are times when, you know, life is inviting you to be kind and caring and compassionate to others. And there are times when, you know, life reciprocates and brings back kindness and caring and courage and right. to you because you, you're in a position of need. But, but, you know, that's a moment where you suddenly realize, my heavens, no, actually one can operate with that largeness of heart, e even in like the most beaten up moments, you know, in one's own life. Yeah, well, um, I, I think this is important, uh, Hitendra. And I think a, another thing that's important is one's motivation. In other words, you're not, um, you're not asking for a karmic kickback from being a nice person, <laughs> you know, that it's genuine. And I think integrity is very essential here. And so I think for, for many of us who particularly, you know, brought up in uh, a Western context where uh, our egos have been strengthened through the um, uh, views and values of our society. And so, you know, we enter practice in order to um, untie those knots. And as I said, it's sometimes a little difficult to do, in, you know, in the final uh, time around the racetrack, so to speak, developing, uh, nourishing, uh, being around people uh, who have this sensibility of compassion is very important. We know that uh, in terms of spheres of influence and uh, the work of Christakis, that, for example, you know, one kind person um, will actually infect positively uh, others, you know, in their first uh, circle of influence. 
first sphere of, of influence. And then out of that sphere, you know, uh, there's the second realm and the third sphere. So, you know, um, one of the things about compassion and altruism, I think that's very interesting is that it's contagious, it's viral. And um, the same is true for um, violence for cruelty, for meanness. And so, you know, there has to be some kind of sense of uh, conscience, like, oh, when I do something that harms others, um, it's not just harming one other person. There's the spheres of influence that multiply in relation to uh, an action or a word that you've uh, engaged in that uh, causes harm to another. Wow, that's two very powerful ideas you just offered, Roshi John. The spheres of influence, the ripple impact of both positive and negative energy you put out there, and then also the intentionality behind what you do. So it's not just what we observe on the outside you're doing. Uh, one of uh, my you know, mentors, he once said to me, it doesn't matter what you do, but the intention with which you do it. Um, and um, uh, what you just said just uh, brought that sort of lesson back back to me. Friends, we are here talking with Roshi John on a luminous life journey that she has been on, where one key part of so many different ways in which she has advanced and contributed to a Buddhist practice and teaching is in helping support the, the dying. Uh, and she has written about it in um, uh, so many different you know, forms. Uh, but the one that I want to highlight is this book, Being with Dying, Cultivating Compassion and Fearlessness in the Presence of Death. Uh, and that is the conversation we're having here with the Roshi John today. You have um, said something really beautiful about motherhood. You know, you've talked about how in those moments where you have at times uh, supported, you know, individuals in the, in the journey to, you know, to the, to the life beyond or the end of at least this life. Uh, you said... When I'm giving care to a dying person, I try both to give and receive kindness as if I were, were the dying one's mother and to see the dying one as my mother, saying silently to myself, now it is time for me to repay the great kindness of all motherly beings. What a powerful thought. Can you, can you unpack that for us a little bit? You know, i uh this notion was um, uh, awakened in me through uh, a, a wonderful Lama, Chagdu Tuku Rinpoche, who's no longer uh, with us in this form in any case. It was when I uh, was practicing with him and he said something that really struck me, that we have all been each other's mother in a previous lifetime. And it was like, oh, and um, when you think of what a mother does in terms of just giving birth and that experience, nourishing the newborn, us, protecting us, uh, he used to say protecting uh, the baby from wild animals, well, maybe the dog or something, but anyway, protecting us, you know, uh, even if our mothers have been messed up. Um, still, uh, we're alive, we're here. Even if they've given us away, then um, the person who adopted us and raised us. So it's just, you know, the, the sensibility of every person that you encounter has been your mother in a previous lifetime. Now, as again, going back to our the first part of our conversation, where um, uh, we were talking about reincarnation. That view comes out of the ethos of re reincarnation. And so it, it's, you know, we've all been each other's mother in a previous lifetime. So if you, you know, kill a bug or eat a shrimp, that's been your mother in a previous lifetime. But I have to tell you, when you have even a drop of that view inside of you, um, it still makes you hesitant to uh, harm uh, uh, beings. And as such, uh, you realize it's not only not harming beings, but it's also this sensibility of repaying the kindness of mothers. And so, you know, it's an ethos that is within the context of Tibetan Buddhism that I was so fortunate to encounter decades ago. And that ethos, um, it deeply influenced my own experience of working with dying people not just myself being a motherly being, 
but also to realize that um, I'm in, ex- in an experience of deep mutuality with the person whom I'm endeavoring to serve. This person also uh, is looking uh, from within uh, their own eyes, own heart, uh, own uh, deeper history uh, of being a motherly being. So it's a, it's a very, I think, a powerful ethos, um, but it's, it's unusual. And what you said before, uh, I think, is very important, and it was in reflection to me talking about one's intention, that um, it is not uh, just a matter of uh, getting a bodhisattva button, <laughs> you know, being recognized uh, as, a, you know, a great person. I don't think Malala... Um, uh, when she, uh, before she became a uh, Nobel laureate, even before she was shot, um, uh, ever thought about, I'm doing this so I will be famous. She uh, endeavored to serve uh, young women in a culture where women are deeply marginalized and serve them through uh, insisting on education for, for young women. And it wasn't, you know, she didn't see herself on the track that she ended up on. She just did what her conscience, her heart drove her to do. And it was in a certain way, she's the most incredible motherly being. But she also sees the motherly beings of young girls, you know, in um, her world. So I think that that sensibility of intention, which does not have a gaining idea, you know, an idea that. I'm going to be well regarded. Uh, I'll be a Nobel laureate. I'll be looked on as a wonderful person. But it's because it's a kind of imperative. It's like you just realize this is the this is the only way. This is this is a calling. This is what needs to be done. And it's at that level of you know heart imperative um, that the sensibility of all motherly beings uh, is instantiated within those who practice in the Tibetan context. But I feel that you know that sensibility is shared in, in many other traditions as well. Ah, uh, uh, how stirring! How stirring! You know, I come from a mathematical kind of sensibility in my background, and there's this notion in in mathematics of fractals. You know, and fractals um, are uh, structures where you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and you can get to the smallest little you know, part of that structure and it will actually reflect the whole structure. Yeah. So encoded in any small part is the whole universe in that regard. And then in science, they have this thing called the hologram, which you know, has a similar kind of property. Any small part contains the whole. And I'm sensing a little bit of that in what you were saying is that as though if we walk away from these quantitative kind of measures of how much fame, how much fortune, how much, you know, acquisitive, you know, impact will I be able to have? Perhaps, you know, there is a capacity that even in the smallest of acts, if we do it with complete attunement and purity, we actually experience almost like a boundless level of just uh, meaning and fulfillment, uh, independent of how much ripples and how much outer acclaim it generates. It's a beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful perspective. And, you know, having it um, uh, explained in mathematical terms is, you know, sort of edifying. So uh, thank you <laughs> very much. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, thank you. You know, I think this is a very important principle for those of us in, you know, in, in our audience here at Intersections who are ambitious, you know, they're driven, they want to, you know, do so much, um, achieve so much for their own selves, their families, but also, you know, feel like they've had a meaningful impact in the world. And sometimes we get all, you know, caught up in these more quantitative measures, right? And so, um, and you know, I speak to that partly from my own personal, you know, questing of the past and everything. So um, th- these are, um, yeah, just like the, the lived struggles that so many of us here among me and my listeners have. So it speaks very closely to my heart. Yeah. Roshi John, you've, um, you've got these really uh, simple but very profound questions that you invite um, at times, you know, the people that you're serving to reflect on that um, in some ways elicit, you know, their stories 
the stories around death that we carry around in our hearts and minds. Um, could you talk a little bit about the logic of that and what those questions are and how they have been of you know of value and service to to these individuals? Well, well, now I'm a little bit uh, stumped, and that is, um, uh, which questions are you talking? Yeah, about? yeah, there the, are <laughs> these questions about you know how you really want to die, for instance. Ah. Well, you know, that is actually an exercise, a practice that we do with um, clinicians who work with dying people. And it's a really fascinating, really powerful exercise. The first part of the exercise, you know, we, we ask um, uh, healthcare workers who, who serve dying people, what is your worst case scenario in how you might die? We ask them to write four or five minutes about that and to be very specific. And then um, I ask them to actually attend to what their experience is physically uh, on reflecting on what they've written, you know, what feelings are present and also what thoughts are passing through their mind. You know, because often clinicians are just jumping into their external experience. Um, you know, of diagnosing and attending and so forth. But actually, you know, part of the training that we do of healthcare workers is to um, allow healthcare workers to attune to their own subjective experience. And then I ask for our, our uh, practitioners to explore, uh, in, in it, this is through a writing practice, you know, writing what is the best case scenario of how you will die. And so they write about this and, um, uh, and, and again, asking them to uh, reflect. And then it's, it's quite fascinating um, because, you know, actually in terms of worst case and best case, we can't ever know, you know, really what is going to happen. But when we unpack that uh, as a community, as a group, you know, we have learned so much you know, some people are very clear they uh, want to die alone. Others, it's their worst nightmare. And yet, you know, we know from working in the field, and, and actually healthcare workers know this, often the family walks out of the room and the person dies. But the question that I ask that really is the showstopper is, how many of you want to die in a hospital setting? And you won't, in general, see a hand raised in the whole group. How many of you want to die in a nursing home? No. And that says a lot about the culture of medicine and also, you know, what clinicians experience working in institutions that are responsible for care of the dying. So part of our own work, um, both as, you know, those of us associated with uh, end-of-life care, but also as so-called lay people, since all of us are going to die, is how do we actually engage in transforming the culture of medicine so that when we enter these institutions that uh, are involved with care, those institutions are places where we will be okay dying in. Now, I hope those were the questions that you were asking. I'm not sure. Yes, yes, very much. And, um, you actually really um, elevated the conversation from beyond just um, the experience of dying and your personal journey in supporting those individuals, more now to also the experience of helping people who are dying, supporting and serving people who are dying. And I would like to, um, in our final moments together, you know, take the conversation there because you know, many of us painfully so from time to time, unavoidably so, are thrust into that role where before we reach that moment ourselves, we are, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, in a place where we, we really want to be able to support, you know, those uh, in our loved circles who are, um, who, are, who are coming to that place before us. Uh, so so th thank you for getting us started on that. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, for, for mere mortals, you know, uh, you know out there uh, between me and, and, and our, our listeners, you know, what, what guidance can you give us on how to uh, really be best of service uh, to, to our loved ones in, mm -hmm. in those moments where we, um, we realize that um, it's time to make peace, you know, with the fact that they're, they're in the final chapter? Yeah. 
It's a beautiful question. And just as I've suggested in relation to uh, the experience of dying, um, I also, uh, for those who are on that part of their life journey, how important it is to familiarize um, oneself with one's mental continuum, with uh, coming into a perspective uh, on the truth of impermanence, on the truth of our mortality, on the possibility that um, our own journey of dying um, is one that will influence others. Um, doing this deep work that is both psychological and spiritual and as well relational, that is to say, coming into this uh, sensibility of um, how do I make peace with those around me? And how do I forgive? And how do I express love? And how do I share my profound appreciation for the lessons of my life? And, and you know, these kind of, uh, um, if you will, psycho existential questions that are uh, important for us to, in an ongoing basis, address in our own lived experience. So that's, that's, you know, it's our personal work, whether you're in the end of life care field or just, you know, the rest of us um, who are not uh, f going to be involved directly in uh, some kind of professional role or volunteer role in care of the dying. Most of us will come um, in relation to a dying person or being your cat, your dog, whereas there, there's this with your pet, a very undefended relationship. And you'll not want to bring your fear of death or your uh, aversion toward pain and suffering um, into the field. Um, so working those questions personally, I think, and also interpersonally within your own uh, uh, sy uh, family system and friend system is really important. The second thing is, is that um, I think volunteering um, within one's community um, in uh, uh, whether it's hospice or a program like No One Dies Alone or um, uh, uh, doing a chaplaincy training so that you're working in a cancer center or so on, you know, having a direct experience of being with dying so that it's not so far from um, what you know uh, in terms of your own lived experience. I think it's incredibly helpful. And you begin to, you know, um, work the edges um, that you have around your fear of death when you're tending the dying. And, you know, I started this work for myself in 1970. So that was, you know, this is when I was a medical anthropologist at the University of, my, uh, University of Miami School of Medicine. And it was in the context of um, being in that medical school that I realized that the most marginalized group of individuals in that medical school, in fact, were dying people. Because basically, uh, death and dying at this time was not something that was, um, it was something that was very feared or denied in our culture. So, you know, I felt the benefit of that work um, and also the deep spiritual experience of being in connection at the level of mutuality with someone who's dying as they're um, letting themselves uh, uh, or not letting, as they're moving through uh, this experience of a letting go. Yeah. So I think that's the, the second thing. And the, the third is to take time away from, if you will, the, the rat race <laughs> of our Western lives and um, uh, let yourself uh, uh, drop into um, uh, a, 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 the awakening of your own natural compassion. And I feel that, um, you know, we're so driven. We, um, we're you know, busyness is one of our favorite, where, how are you doing? I'm busy. And that, you know, this backward step, the exhale, the opportunity to um, uh, allow yourself to uh, go deeper into who you really are is something that I encourage uh, all of us to do. You're reminding me of um, the one life that I've lost of someone very dear and close to me, and that was my father. And, um, you know, there was this very spiritual moment for me where after his cremation, you know, as is the tradition in India, you go um, 
you know, the next morning, you know, after the funeral pyre has, you know, consumed his body uh, and you um, just collect together the ashes and, um, you know, there might be some small little bones that have not been fully, you know, burnt out. So you, you collect all, all the remnants and put them into a casket and then you take them to India's holy river, the Ganges and, you know, offer them, you know, offer them to, to nature. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was, of course, going through, uh, you know, uh, all these undulating emotions over the course of the last few, you know, few hours and, you know, a couple of days as uh, we, you know, we learned about his passing and come there and, and um, you know, been there to support, you know, each other and uh, cremate his body. Uh, but in that moment where that early, you know, dawn, the next morning, I'm there to pick up the ashes and, and uh, the small few other remnants, um, I was... I, I just, I almost had like a reaction of like a victorious smile, you know, it was like a smile I experienced because it was as if like I was unburdening myself from uh, seeing my father's identity completely fused with the body. Mm. Right? And I realized like Hitendra, this body was always just, in some ways, it was just an illusion because, you know, this is how you've yeah. known him and experienced him all through mm. your life from the moment you were born. But look how instantly it can vanish and just get to reintegrate, you know, with, with, with nature uh, as, as, as it has in the last 24 hours, just instantly, instantly. Whereas you thought it had a certain permanence to it. And yet, on the other hand, you know, you know in the depths of your soul that he lives on. You know, he, yeah. he lives on. There's just no way you're convinced that uh, with the passing of this body that, you know, he at, at his essence, you know, has seized uh, existence, you know. So so um, it was actually in some ways a very liberating, you know, kind of moment for me to, you know, as you said, like get away from those knots, you know, get to untie those knots. So there's this big knot in my head, which... Mm -hmm. uh, made me identify reality purely in terms of the physical separatedness of our beings. And yet in that moment, I, I felt something much more profound, uh, you know, happen. So um, I wouldn't have had that if I hadn't really leaned into that moment, faced it. And sometimes I wonder here, you know, in the West, as you've said about the process of dying mm -hmm. in, in the hospitals and the medical system, but also in the process of dealing with the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the dead body, you know, that there can be actually so much realization uh, that can, and strength that can come even in having to really face it and deal with it yourself, you know, which is, I think, in India, it's much more common for relatives to hold, touch, sometimes, you know, wash, and then clothes, and then, <laughs> you know, cremate, yeah. or, or, or bury, you know, but it's, it's a more hands-on experience. Thank you for sharing that story. It's very powerful. It illustrates uh, how important it is that we bring death closer into our lives. You have um, shared a beautiful, you know, story of, of your own about, um, you know, the moment where your, your, your father was passing away. And that kind of inspired me to share, share, share mine, uh, Roshi John. But um, yeah, can, can you just maybe... In, uh, you know, a brief way, I just share, you know, that, that realization that you, you, you had when, when, when you um, had to really face up to his physical impermanence? Well, I'm not sure which uh, story, but I, I, one just came to mind. Um, I don't know if it's the one that you're, you're suggesting, sure. but so my, my father, maybe uh, you felt about your father like I felt about mine. I, I had really loved my father. And I think I loved him because he, he accepted me very completely. I, I, I chose quite an eccentric path in my life. And, uh, you know, most parents would be disappointed in uh, the choices that uh, I made. But my father was always supportive uh, in a very unconditional way. At least he made me feel as if he were, you know, completely supportive. And you never know really what's going on. But uh, then, you know, uh, his life was coming to an end. And um, we brought him home. And uh, uh, my sister's children, my sister and I and his uh, wife, uh, we, we were all sitting with him. And then um, he began to flail. 
And it was um, pretty disturbing. You know, he's quite an old person and um, the skin on his arms was very fragile and began to, you know, uh, his arms began to bleed as he was flailing his arms around and he was, you know, way out of it. And uh, I just, I couldn't, oh, just seeing him that way was so disturbing. And then I realized that, you know, it wasn't a matter of holding him down or talking him down. Um, I actually uh, sat behind uh, his head. Um, of course, he was, you know, uh, in, in bed, uh, in a hospital bed in our, our living room. I sat behind his bed and I put my hands on either side of his head. And I said, uh, and it was unprescribed, you know, uh, I didn't get this in a book. It just came out of my heart. I said to him repeatedly, thank you, daddy. Thank you, daddy. And um, after a while, the flailing uh, diminished and um, uh, he uh, relaxed. And then he moved into, you know, a state where he... Uh, uh, was in that those long uh, exhales, which went uh, through the night uh, into the dawn. And I still uh, sat um, behind his head saying um, those words, which just were, they were a mantra. You know, there was just the incredible gratitude I felt toward my father for all he had given me. He had even said to me once, you know, by the before he got quite ill, um, he said, you know, you're traveling all over the world and you're doing all this, that, and the other thing. And he said, you're living the life that um, I wish I could have lived. And I said to him, uh, actually, you gave me that life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the sort of the thank you, daddy, was uh, an expression of that uh, natural gratitude that um, arose in this moment where um, I couldn't control anything, but I could feel. And those were the words that carried him into peace. And then I remember sitting, you know, uh, as uh, the morning unfolded and um, watching and sensing into these long, long exhales. And at a certain point, there was no inhale. The chest rose as if to uh, invite the breath in, but um, nothing entered. And um, it was, you know, uh, I, I think my experience was very similar to yours. You know, it was a mixture of, um, there was grief there, but um, there was also joy. There was also incredible love. I felt such uh, gratitude not only for his life, um, but that those final hours of his life were uh, ones of great peace where he had received um, the gratefulness of his children and his grandchildren. And so it's this deep sense of fulfillment. And I realized at that moment um, we were also, and how we were with him, uh, you know, he became an ancestor. And you know, whatever that means, you know, again, I'm so pragmatic. I don't want to make things romantic or anything. But it was more that um, he awakened in us in a different way. He was alive in a different way. And this is decades later since his death. And, you know, I know uh, my niece and nephew and my sister, we all feel the same, that he is a, a living presence um, between us and within us. Oh, that is so, so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing so freely and, yeah, inspiring me with us, you know, that um, that moment um, so many of us have to have to face uh, the, the death of someone very dear to us um, and and perhaps even bearing witness to it. Um, yeah. And and you you also, you, you've written about how um, two days before he died, um, you know, there was a nurse who approached him and asked him, how, how are you feeling, Mr. Halifax? And, and then, you know, how did he reply to that? He said everything. Everything. Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Do you feel there's that, you know, for, I guess, the life well lived, you know, is there that sort of expansion of consciousness in some ways, a connectedness that 
he was referring to that comes? You know, um, he tender. He was a genuinely kind person, and um, it wasn't kind um, to be, uh, you know, to win social approval. Um, it was simply how he was. He he cared uh, about, you know, the well-being of others. He he didn't think about himself so much. And um, as, as such, I, I think that's the sensibility that um, allowed him to feel everything because he, at some preconscious level, knew he was not separate from anything. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. We've had a, such a beautiful journey over the last hour or so with you, uh, Roshi John, and I'm just so grateful. And there is, you know, there's a wealth of uh, more stories and experiences that we could continue to draw out from you, but I'm respectful, you know, of, uh, of your time. And um, I pray and hope that we have another opportunity to also have a pass cross and perhaps have you come and share more, you know, with the with our friends here, um, you know, I'm intrigued about um, so much that you've done over the decades. Um, you've, um, you know, learned from so many teachers. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Deet Nat Han. Um, you know, I also understand you've spent time with uh, Joseph Campbell, another of my, you know, heroes uh, from modern times for very beautiful and pioneering work he's done. And um, and anyway, so I, I realized that we could we could go on and on. Um, but just to maybe in the spirit of bringing us to closing, I have two final maybe requests of you. One is uh, for both of these individuals we just talked about. Yeah. Is there any like one impression about them that uh, you carry that, you know, that you could share with us as to, you know, who these people were to you and their presence? Um, well, uh I was I was very fortunate um, to uh, be quite close with Joe Campbell um, in uh, the 1970s, and um, you know I worked on his historical atlas of world mythology. But he also was my stand-in father uh, during my one and only marriage. I got married, you know, again with my biological father. But um, in any case, uh, Joe and I. Uh, we, we had a lot of love for each other. And I think the thing that uh, Joe carried, you know, he was a, a kind of a prophet. Um, and, he, you know, his own sensibility of the human potential to uh, awaken, but also to see connection, um, to see connections, to see things as uh, linked and influencing each other. So he, you know, he was a, a bard, a prophet, a uh, 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 someone who used myth as a vehicle for um, bringing the best of the, the human heart forward in the world through his work. And of course, we all learned so much from his book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was, of course, influenced by the work of Mircea Iliadi, which is influenced by the work of the Dutch ethnologist Arnold van Hennep, and, you know, uh, he saw the value of uh, rites of passage, of, you know, of us going through suffering and then finding, you know, what would give our lives meaning and purpose. And then, uh, as you know, I met uh, Thich Nhat Hanh in the mid-60s um, when he was in New York and then became a student 20 years later and practiced with him for quite a few years. And um, his own... Uh, um, this vision of seeing the Buddha as the Sangha, his emphasis on community, on uh, uh, interbeing, um, uh, the realization that we're not separate from the very atmosphere that we're breathing. We're not separate from each other. We're not separate from the blossoms of spring or the wind of spring. And so, you know, that sensibility of being peace, of interbeing, and of interconnectedness um, is something that uh, um, he conveyed uh, through his personality and also through uh, the kind of practice that he introduced the West to. So as we know, he, he left us in January in the body, but I think his influence as well as Joe's uh, influence, you know, um, will have, uh, continue to have a, a, a profound impact on global society, and we need it right now.
we really need their view and their vision and their values. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. You've given us such beautiful glimpses into them and uh, brought them even more richly to life for us. Um, so grateful. And um, yeah, what a what a beautiful life uh, for you to, in the course of these last several decades, have been so invested and so close to so many great teachers. Uh, and so to to close us out, I have my final, I guess, you know, ask of you, which is, um, yeah, could you could you share like at this stage when you look ahead at your at your next uh, chapter, what's you know what's your what's your big dream, what's your big aspiration in the in the years ahead? Well, that's that's a very uh, fun question to ask and difficult. Um, you know, I feel like I was born for this time. Uh, this is not an easy time to be alive. But I, I feel that, you know, whatever I've been given in this life, um, I feel I can turn toward the well-being of not only others um, like myself as a human, but really uh, toward the fate of the earth. And so, you know, my own aspirations are to, you know, I hope I can stay healthy so I can continue to serve. Very mm -hmm. simply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, how oh, beautiful, how oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Roshi John and, uh, you know, praying and wishing you very well on your journey and those around you as well who I know uh, collaborate with you in this beautiful service that you're doing. I'm very grateful to have you with us today and to have you in the world with us. Oh. Well, it's been an honor to meet you and to yeah. receive your questions and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful we had this time together and I look forward to us meeting again. And thank you so, so much.